All right, uh, you're getting a handout tonight about, uh, uh, about Mormonism, and it's not something necessarily that you'd want to follow along. I just thought you'd like to have this in your file. It's a compilation of a whole lot of information that I've gathered uh, regarding Mormonism over all the years, and we'll not be able to cover everything that's in this. Uh, on the back of this, in, in the one that's called the uh, Timeline of Mormonism, is a summation of, uh, of the story that's in the Book of Mormon. And uh, uh, you might want to have a look at that. We've talked about the fact that, uh, you know, uh, people came over from the Tower of Babel and then they came from the Babylonian captivity. And the, remember when they came from the Tower of Babel, they, they had built something like the ark, but they had a little problems in it because the Lord had forgot to provide for air inside the ark and for uh, 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 water inside the ark uh, to drink. And let's see, air, air, no, it was air and light is what it was. And uh, so God worked out a solution. And, uh, uh, you know, the, the Almighty God sort of solved it for them because he said, uh, uh, drill a hole in the bottom and a hole in the top and that'll work. And I don't know if you've ever been in a boat that has a hole in the bottom and a hole in the top. And, uh, but that's the boat they came on because God forgot, he, he, he did better with Noah. You know, he said, put a window in it, put a door in it and everything. But uh, whenever it came to telling Jared how to leave the Tower of Babel, the, um, uh, the, he didn't make it. I think, I think everybody's got one, okay? All right, yes. All right, thank you very much. And so, so what, what I'm talking about is this timeline of Mormonism. And, and uh, it, they all died out. The group that came from the Tower of Babel died out. And so then the group that came from the Babylonian captivity, they came in America, and that's, uh, they, they're in, in some respects the, uh, uh, the beginnings of the American Indians and things of that nature. It is rather ironic, and uh, I don't know if we've mentioned this at all, but uh, some of our black members have mentioned it to me because of their knowledge of Mormonism. Uh, the, the God placed a curse on the bad guys that came from the Tower of Babel, those that were ungodly when they got over here and, and made them black. And for the longest time, up until about, I don't know, was it 15 years ago, uh, blacks could not occupy places of high authority in the Mormon church. And it's because of a curse that God had placed on the black. And all that is, is a reflection of the human aspect of this religion. You go back to the 1830s and 40s and 50s, you talk about racial prejudice. And so Joseph Smith starts a, a religion up in New York, and it's all right to talk about the blacks, you know, in, in that way. There were not all that many blacks up in the north in that way. And so uh, there, was, there was strong racial prejudice against the blacks, uh, and, and that's where they ca came from. And it's only been in the last 10 or 15 years that they, they got a revelation because they believe they have 12 apostles still out there in Utah, and they have the, they have the head of the church, and he can change doctrine anytime he wants to. And uh, so all, all of that is, is what's on the timeline. The other thing is, is the thing that we've been looking at and you might want to look through these, and if, if you see some of them you want to ask questions about tonight, because uh, this likely will be the last night we'll deal with Mormonism. This class is to be on uh, Mormonism and Jehovah's Witnesses, so uh, very soon we're going to uh, leave Mormonism behind and go over and start talking about the Jehovah's Witnesses on Wednesday night. And uh, so uh, you might want to look through some of these contradictions if you have any comments about them. The, the, the paragraphs on the front of this that's called the contradictions of Mormonism, there, there's some uh, words there from, um, who's that? Uh, uh, it, it's Pratt. Who is that? I can't, can't think of his first name. He's one of the three witnesses to the Book of, Book of Mormon. I almost said Godfrey Pratt, and for some reason, I don't, I don't think it was Godfrey Pratt, but uh, uh, one of the three witnesses that's there. Um, no, he's, he's, not, he's not one of the three witnesses, but he was an early leader in the Mormon religion. And he says, and I think it's rather interesting, um, the, uh, 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 we must decide in this manner if the book is true or false. I'm reading from C on, on page one. This, muck, this book must be either true or false. If true, it's one of the most important messages ever sent from God, affecting temporal and eternal interests of every people under heaven to the same extent, the same degree, the message of Noah affecting the inhabitants of the old world. If false, it's one of the most cunningly wicked, bold, deep laid impositions ever palmed upon the world, calculated to deceive and ruin millions, millions 
who will sincerely receive it as the Word of God and will su suppose themselves se securely built upon the rock of truth until they are plunged with their families into hopeless despair. And, and that's true, and that's a Mormon's evaluation of it. And that's, that's exactly what they believe. That, uh, that, it, that it is, if it's true, you've got to believe it. But uh, if it's false, it is, it's a wretched, wretched, wretched thing. Uh, that next paragraph says, The nature of the message in the Book of Mormon is such that if true, no one can possibly be saved and reject it, the Book of Mormon. If false, no one can possibly be saved and receive it. Isn't that amazing? And, and so that's how uh, diabolical this book is if it's false. And by their own admissions, they said, this is one of the greatest hoax that's ever been perpetuated upon mankind if it is false. Now, the approach that we have taken uh, in, in much of this study is to talk about the things that are in the Book of Mormon that just cannot be true. And there, that's why we have all of the list of all of the contradictions uh, that, that are here. There, there is one on, um, on, well, if you'll turn the page, it'd be the third printed page. It's Doctrines and Covenants versus the Book of Mormon. I want to read to you some of the things from, uh, from, from the, uh, about Mormonism and, and, uh, and uh, uh, how it condemns polygamy. You, you, you are aware, are you not, of, of the fact that there were... Uh, there are three divine books that the Mormons recognize in addition to the Bible. And, uh, and so they recognize the Book of Mormon. They recognize doctrine and covenants. And, and, uh, and, and they recognize uh, the pearl of great price. And, and it, it's amazing to me that, that uh, in the Book of Mormon, the Book of Mormon condemns polygamy. You may, you, when you think of Mormons... That's all you think of is the, is the matter of, uh, of polygamy. Well, when this book, Book of Mormon, was revealed, he hadn't figured out about polygamy. It's in these other books that polygamy is, is to be found. And so early in the history of Mormonism, in the, you know, when, when this is published, the Book of Mormon, the Book of Mormon over and over and over again uh, uh, condemns polygamy. Let me read to you from, from the book of Jacob. He says, And now it came to pass that the people of Nephi, under the reign of the second king, began to grow hard in their hearts and indulge themselves somewhat in wicked practices, such as like unto David of old, desiring many wives and concubines, and also Solomon his son. So when Mormonism starts, and when you have the revelation of, of the book of Mormon, before he ever gets a revelation about polygamy, and you see, here's the dilemma you have. Which of these is true? Both of these books, both of these born in books cannot be true. I'll read to you in a few minutes about uh, polygamy in, in the Book of Mormon or in Doctrines and Covenants. But listen to the words here. They began, they hardened their hearts and indulged themselves in wicked practices, desiring many wives and concubines like Solomon and David did. That, that, that's, pretty, that's pretty remarkable. Uh, turning the page, Jacob chapter 2. Behold, David and Solomon truly had many wives and concubines, which thing was an abomination before me, says the Lord. Skipping down to verse 28. For I, the Lord, delight in the chastity of women, and whoredoms are an abomination before me. Thus says the, uh, the Lord of hosts. Turning the page to chapter, uh, chapter 3. Uh, Behold the Lamanites, your brethren, whom you hated because of their filthiness and cursings which have come in, in their skins, are more righteous than you, for they have not forgotten the commandments of the Lord which was given to our fathers. They should, they should have, uh, save it were, were but one wife. So here's the Lamanites, and they're the, they're, they're the ones that became black, and that's what, that's what he says. Behold the Lamanites, your brethren, whom you hate because of, the, of their filthiness and cursings which has come upon their skins. And so where the Lamanites came from, God, God changed them into black folks. But they were more righteous than the good guys. Because the good, the, at least they only had one wife, that they should, uh, should have one wife, and concubines, they should have none, and there should not be whoredoms committed among them. What does the Book of Mormon teach about polygamy? 
Well, you, you, you read all of these things and, and you see that it says it's an abomination to God. Now, this book is finished. Book of Mormon is finished. It's, uh, you know, it's printed, uh, uh, what, what, what's that year? 18, 1830, about 1830. Is, it's, uh, uh, the, yes, it's first published in 1830. Now, as Mormonism develops, they get all of these other revelations. And so Joseph Smith decides that, that uh, they, must, they must believe um, in polygamy. Let, let me read to you uh, what Joseph Smith later said. You can't believe Joseph Smith here and Joseph Smith here. Now, the attack people make against the Bible. If there are contradictions in the Bible, you can't trust it. And, uh, and, 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 and sometimes the Mormons themselves will seek to destroy people's faith in the Bible. And they'll go to that statement about uh, in Acts chapter, uh, uh, chapter 9, Paul's conversion, he heard a voice. And uh, a little bit later he said he did not hear the voice. And that, by that statement mean, did not understand the voice. And they destroy people's faith in the Bible because it's got contradictions in it. And if the Bible is contradictory, you ought not to listen to it. But here, in words that cannot be misunderstand, misunderstood, it's an abomination to God. Over and over and over again, polygamy is an abomination. Now then, Joseph Smith decides that uh, he needs to have a new revelation. And so this is the year 1843, 13 years after the publishing of the other book, second inspired book, uh, this revelation is given. I reveal unto you a new and an everlasting covenant, and if you believe not that covenant, then you're damned. For no one can reject, reject this covenant and be permitted to enter into my glory. I want you to hear how emphatic. Now, what's this revelation going to be about? He's about to reveal God's new revelation about polygamy. And so in the, in the, in the preface to it, that's in verse 4, here's a new covenant. And if you don't believe in polygamy, you are damned. You cannot reject this covenant and be permitted to enter into my glory. You see how contradictory these things are? And the, the, sometimes when you talk to Mormons, when I've talked to the elders about it, I'd say, uh, 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 I've talked to them, and, and they said, well, we don't do it. Well, there's no way you cannot do it and expect to go to heaven. And there are, in Utah, some of those fundamentalists, by the way, that still practice polygamy. You read about that every now and then. And by the way, the, uh, the rejection of the Defense of Marriage Act that has allowed homosexual marriages will, opens the door wide open for polygamy. I mean, I mean if, if homosexual marriages uh, are allowed, polygamy is, is allowed also. I mean, it's a wide open door and, and I, uh, in relationship to this. He talks about uh, some of the angels, and I'll just read you this. These my angels did not abide in my law. Therefore, they cannot be enlarged, but remain separately and singly without exultation in their saved condition to all eternity. And for hence, from henceforth, they are not gods, but are angels of God forever. So there's these angels that sin. Instead of them being cast down into hell, they're just not going to be able to climb the evolutionary tree to become gods. Mormons who, Mormons who understand Mormonism, uh, and it's a, part of the, it's a fundamental part of their doctrine, is that God used to be a man and that someday we will be like God, but when we get where God is, God will be moved on. And the statement that's in their writings is, as we are now, so once was God, as God is now, so shall we be. And so here are these angels, and, and that's just a part of that. Um, the, uh, it, 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 it's remarkable. That's so, then he says, uh, Go ye therefore and do the works of Abraham. Enter into my law and you shall be saved. You, you cannot enter into my law and receive, you cannot, but if you enter not into my law, you cannot receive the promise of my father which you made unto Abraham. God commanded Abraham and Sarah gave Hagar to Abraham to wife. And why did she do it? Because that, this was the law. And from Hagar sprang many people. This, therefore, was fulfilling, among other things, the promises. So here's Abraham having a concubine named Hagar. And, and Joseph Smith says, Go, therefore, and do the works of Abraham. Now listen to this. 
David also received many wives and concubines, and also Solomon and Moses, my servant. David I knew, Moses I knew, or pardon me, Solomon I knew. I didn't know Moses it was a polygamist. That's, that's, aren't you glad you've got this revelation here? And also many others of my servants from the beginning of the creation unto this time, and in nothing did they sin save in those things which they received not of me. David's wives and concubines were given unto him by me. This is God, God speaking. David's wives and concubines were given unto him by me, by the hand of Nathan, my servant, and other of the prophets who had the keys of the power. And in none of these things did he sin against me, save in the case of Uriah's wife. And so where did David get his multiple wives? God gave him his multiple wives. Uh, here is a, here's the interesting part to me. Joseph Smith's wife's name was Emma. And so here, this, I read verse 4 to you that says you've got to believe this uh, revelation. When you get to verse 54, <coughs> in my mind I see Joseph Smith writing this and think, wonder what Emma's going to think. Well, you know, wonder what Emma's going to think. And I don't know that's the circumstances. That's just Dan's imagination running in this. But you get to verse 54, and so Joseph Smith, God says, Oh, I have a message for Emma. I command my handmaiden, Emma Smith, to abide and to cleave unto my servant Joseph and to none else. But if she will not abide in this commandment, she shall be destroyed, says the Lord. For I am the Lord thy God, and I will destroy her if she abide not in my law. But if she will not abide this commandment, then, then shall my servant Joseph do all things for her, even as I've said unto him. And I, will, if she, uh, and I will bless him and multiply him and give unto him a hundredfold into this world. And here's a Bible verse quotation. Uh, a hundredfold in this world, fathers and brothers and brothers and sisters and houses and lands. Didn't Jesus say that? Joseph just adds one other, one other things to the list. Jesus says, if a man leaves his, his father or mother or brothers or sisters, he will receive a hundredfold in this life. Joseph sort of likes that verse. He just adds one little thing to it, and that is, uh, he'll give unto him an hundredfold in this world of fathers and mothers and brothers and sisters, houses and land, wives and children and crowns of eternal lives in the eternal world. And, uh, and again, barely I say, let my handmaiden forgive my servant Joseph his trespasses. So Emma, God's got a message for you. You, you forgive Joseph of everything he does. And then she shall be forgiven her trespass, trespasses, wherein she has trespassed against me. And I, the Lord thy God, will bless her and multiply her and make her heart to rejoice. And uh, uh, then uh, let, me, let, let, me just, let me just read the end part of it. And I read this to Mormon elders multitudes of time when they said, well, we just don't practice it. And again, it's pertaining to the law of priesthood. If any man espouse a virgin and desires to espouse another, and the first give her consent, and if he espouse the second, and they are virgins, and they have vowed to no other man, then he is justified, he cannot commit adultery. For they are given unto him. For he cannot commit adultery with, 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 with that which belongs unto him and to no one else. And if he has ten virgins given unto him by this law, he cannot commit adultery, for they belong to him, and they are given unto him, therefore he is justified. That's Mormonism. And so I wanted to spend a little time talking about the matter of polygamy just so you understand. The Book of Mormon does not allow polygamy. Absolutely does not. Thirteen years later, gets another revelation, and they are as contradictory as anything can be. Yes, yes, Derek. Speak loud. No, it didn't, didn't give, she probably had her own list, and so it, it, it included everything on the list. I'm not sure. Isn't that amazing? I mean, that, that, that's really, really amazing. We mentioned that there are two large groups of Mormons. There's one in, in Missouri and the other's in Utah. The, the large group in, in Missouri that has about a million Mormon members rejects Doctrine and Covenants. And so the difference between the, what's called the reorganized Church of Jesus Christ of the Latter-day Saints 
and uh, and uh, the 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 Utah Church of Jesus Christ of Latter Day Saints is the 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 group in Missouri rejects doctrine and the covenants. They they and uh, they they reject it all. Um, I, I guess that's it. Uh, well, under further, further contradictions and absurdities, that's under Roman numeral number six, the farce of Mormon 17-year-old elders. If, uh, if Mormons knock on your door, uh, go ahead and invite them in and say, oh, you are an elder. Well, that's interesting. You know, uh, I've read in the Bible about elders. Can we read this together? Why can you not have 17-year-old elders? He's got to have a wife, the husband of one wife. He's got to be married, and he's got to have children who are Christians. And uh, I remember in one study with, uh, I had with, with two Mormon elders, and when we got to the end of the study, they said, it's obvious we're not elders, what are we? I mean, they had, they had enough respect for the Bible, and, went, I, and I said, well, you may be elders in the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, but if you'd been in the Church of Jesus Christ of the First-day Saints, you could not have been elders. And I make a play on, on their words because the Mormons say we've got to go back and restore the church. And in the restoration of it, under that other contradiction, I've got the matter of the um, uh, unbiblical offices like the 70s and the high priests and the patriarchs and the presidents and things of that nature. Totally different structure, uh, uh, hierarchy in the church is just, just truly remarkable. Interesting religion. Having said all of that, if I study with Mormons, I don't necessarily, depending on, depending on how long I study with I don't spend a whole lot of time on this stuff right here. There's a, there's a much simpler way to deal with it. There are two questions to be answered. And these two questions are the death of Mormonism and other religions based on Latter-day Revelation. We're going to talk about Jehovah's Witnesses soon. And the Jehovah's Witness believes that the watchtower is as authoritative as the Bible. Two questions that you need to, to be aware of and especially in a discussion with Mormons. Number one is, was all of the truth given in the first century? Uh, you know the answer to that. If you listen to David's sermon Sunday night, you know the answer. The faith, Jude verse 3, the faith which was, past tense, once and for all. That can't be twice. Once and for all delivered to the saints. The whole basis of, of Mormonism is that plain and precious parts have been lost out of the Bible. And we read in the introductory several weeks ago as we were talking about Mormonism and their attitude toward you, the Book of Mormon says, a fool, a fool. Those that say, we have a Bible, what need do we have for any other Bible? And that's their attitude toward you. And you need to understand that whenever, if they come and knock on your doors, that they'll say, oh, we believe the Bible. They don't. You know, all of the contradictions that's in the Bible about Jesus being born in uh, Bethlehem contradicts the Book of Mormon saying he's born in Jerusalem. About Jesus being on the cross and there was darkness for three hours and the Book of Mormon says it was th for three days and three days of darkness over the entire face of the earth. It doesn't just say in America. It says over the entire face of the earth there was darkness for three days. Isn't that remarkable? And you ask them, which one's right? They don't believe the Bible. And you've got to understand that. And so whenever they come and they say, well, we really, really believe the Bible, they've got a problem. Because the Bible and the Book of Mormon are absolute opposites of each other. 
And so the first question to be, de be determined is, was all of the truth given in the first century? In John chapter 16, verse 13, Jesus said to the apostles in, in verse 7 and 8 and 9, I have a lot of things to tell you guys, but you're not able to receive them now. They didn't even understand what he'd taught them in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. How on earth would they understand the very nature of the church and all the other things that are later to be revealed? They didn't even grasp what he had taught them. But he says, I'm going away and I'm going to send the Holy Spirit unto you. He, by the way, will bring to your minds everything that I've said. He'll show you things to come. And so that's why we know that we can trust Matthew's recall of what Jesus said. That's why we know we can quote the Sermon on the Mount and know that's exactly what Jesus said. When the Spirit comes, He will bring to your remembrance everything, all the things. Well, if He, didn't, if he left out a word of it, it didn't bring everything. And the language says, He'll bring you your remembrance everything that I've said to you. And that's why you can trust Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. That was the nature of the work of the Holy Spirit. But he says, he'll bring to your remembrance, he will show you things to come, and he will guide you into all truth. That promise was made to the apostles. And if you ask the question, was all of the truth given in the first century? How can you say it plainer than the truth which was once for all delivered to the saints? What about 2 Peter chapter 1 and verse 3? That God has given us everything that pertains to life and godliness. You see the tense there? Not God is or God will. Or whenever Joseph Smith digs up the plates up there in New York, then you'll have it all. Peter writes 2 Peter and says, God has given us everything that pertains to life and godly. Question number one, was all of the truth given in the first century? And when you get to the bottom line of that, 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16 and 17 says, All scripture is inspired of God, profitable for doctrine, reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, complete, thoroughly furnished, completely furnished unto every good work. When you've got the scriptures, that's all of the truth there is. And we've got to understand and appreciate the power of those statements. Now the other one is, will all the truth abide? Can you think of any verse in the Bible that talks about the abiding nature of the, of the truths in the Bible? There are two verses that talk about heaven and earth passing away. You know any of those verses? Look in the Sermon on the Mount. And by the way, this Sermon on the Mount is written by Matthew, Matthew chapter 5. And remember the Holy Spirit brought to Matthew's mind every word, everything that Jesus said. What did Jesus say? Matthew 5 verse 17. Do not think I came to destroy the law or the prophets. I did not come to destroy but to fulfill. For assuredly I say to you, till heaven and earth pass away, one jot or one tittle will by no means pass from the law till all is fulfilled. Now our problem is we don't know what a jot is. And we've done this before, but let's do it again just so that, uh, so that you'll have an appreciation and an understanding of it. Look in the book of Psalm. Keep your finger here, by the way, in Matthew 5. But look in the book of Psalm 119. Look at Psalm 119. Right before the word blessed in verse 1. Does your Bible have a, have a word that's there? 
You see that? Psalm 119, verse 1. Look at your Bible. You have a word that's there? You want to spell it if you don't pronounce it? You see that Aleph, A-L-E-P-H? You see that? You may not have it in your Bible. Is it in the, uh, is, is this the pew Bible you have? Yes. yes. Okay, pick up a pew Bible. If your Bible doesn't have it, what page is that on, uh, Freddie? That's 545. 545, pick up a pew Bible and look at that word Aleph. Look to the left of the word Aleph. Do you see anything that's there? <laughs> Chicken scratching, is that what it looks like? That's the Hebrew alphabet. That is the first letter of the Hebrew alphabet. And every verse in the first eight verses of Psalm 119, every verse starts with Aleph. It is an acrostic. And so, so in Psalm 119, in the first eight verses... Every one of those verses in Hebrew starts with that letter. Look at before verse 9. You see before verse 9? You see another word? Beth. You see to the left of that? Do you see a second Hebrew letter? There are 22 letters in the Hebrew alphabet. And this section of Psalm 119 is divided up the 176 verses is divided up in groups of eight. Eight times 22 is 176. And every verse, verse 9 through 16, starts with the letter Beth. And so the Holy Spirit of God gave an acrostic. And, and it's obvious in the Hebrew. It's not obvious in the Greek. Look after verse 72 before verse 73. Look before verse 73. Do you see uh, another word that's there? Yod. And you look to the left. How small is a yod? Can you see it? Does it look almost as big as a comma? Do you know another word for yod? Is jot. The Y and the J in Hebrew. That's why you have Jehovah and Yahweh. Very, very similar. And so that's what a jot looks like. You see how little it is? It's the smallest letter in the Hebrew alphabet. Now what did Jesus say? Go back to Matthew 5. Till heaven and earth shall pass away, one jot will not pass from the law. The Son of God living on this earth gives absolute assurance that the 1,500 years of the writing of the Old Testament, every part of the Old Testament was there and every jot was still there. God's not going to give the truth and then let it pass away. How do I know? Heaven and earth shall pass away, but one jot or one tittle. You know what a tittle is? A tittle in, in English is what changes, get a, get a mental picture, a capital F into a capital E. You see the difference in a capital F and a capital E? Do you know in English the name of that little bar that you add to the capital F to turn it into a capital E? It's the word tittle. In the Greek or in the Hebrew, it is the slightest little mark that changes one Hebrew letter into another letter. And so not only the smallest letter, but just the tiniest stroke of the Hebrew, t- and G- of the Hebrew pen. And Jesus said, every jot and every tittle is still there. Why would God work to give the truth and then let it be lost? Well, look in Matthew chapter 24. I remember discovering this verse from the Mormons. And I said, you guys say you believe the Bible as far as it is uh, correctly translated. Why does not the president of of the Mormon church, why doesn't it make an inspired translation? And I was not aware of this at that time. The Mormon said, Joseph Smith started it. Guess what? In pearl of great price, 
is an inspired translation of a part of the book of Matthew. Guess what part he translated. You talk about who knows but the providence of God. It's Matthew 24. Look in Matthew chapter 24, verse 34. Uh, verse 35. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will by no means pass away. Guess what Joseph Smith inspired translation says. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. It's ironic that when Joseph Smith started translating the Bible, <laughs> one of the inspired translation of the chapter, he didn't translate many verses, but that's one of the verses he translated. And it's the one that says all of the truth was given. We've showed the other verses. This is the one that says it will never pass away. If it never passed away, we don't need this. The whole basis of Mormonism is plain and precious parts were lost, passed away, and God had to reveal them through Joseph Smith. You cannot believe Matthew chapter 24, verse 35, and say as a Mormon that parts of the Bible have been lost. Psalm 119, 160 says, Every one of your righteous precepts endures forever. What's Mormonism? It's an unusual religion. Now, having said that, Mormons are some of the most highly moral people you'll know. They're just blinded. And uh, we need to be aware of it. You may find it interesting that the preacher at, uh, in Kissimmee at the congregation there, if you ever go to Disney and go to Kissimmee, the preacher that's there is a former Mormon who has found the truth and is now uh, preaching at the Lord's Church up at Kissimmee in Orlando. That's it. Uh, we'll, we'll, we'll head and start talking about Jehovah's Witnesses next. <laughs>